اشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي so um, we're on hadith number 17 and inshallah it's not very lengthy or you know inshallah we should be able to cover it uh, all in one lesson uh, the next hadith is going to be long so that's going to probably take a couple of lessons but i'm going to read the hadith out to you first an abi ala shaddad ibn aws ibn aws radiyallahu anhu anna rasulullah an rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قال إن الله كتب الإحسان على كل شيء فإذا قتلتم فأحسنوا القتلة وإذا ذبحتم فأحسنوا الذبحة وليحد أحدكم شفرته فليرح ذبيحته رواه مسلم On the authority of Abu Ya'ala Shaddad ibn Aus May Allah be pleased with him From the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم who said Verily, Allah has prescribed excellence. Uh, verily, Allah has prescribed excellence in all things. Thus, if you kill, kill in a good manner. If you slaughter, slaughter in a good manner. Each of you should sharpen his blade and spare suffering to the animal he is slaughtering. Recorded by Muslim. So, um, what we see here is that... Um, the main theme of this hadith is uh, that when you do something, you do it properly. The main theme here is ihsan. Um, now, um, interestingly, you know, uh, something like ihsan, which you associate with um, with excellence, with uh, you know, with Allah seeing you and you trying to do something while you see Allah and things like that. You know, the examples that the Prophet ﷺ has used in this hadith are um, of things that we associate with brutality, such as murder, killing, and things like that. We will come back to this, inshallah, and explain, you know, how this all fits in, inshallah. Um, before we carry on, um, like we always do, we have, um, you know, we have a new narrator for this hadith. So we're going to talk briefly about the, you know, the life of the narrator. So his name is Shaddad ibn Aus. His full name is Shaddad ibn Aus ibn Thabit al-Ansari al-Khazraji. Uh, you can tell from his name, the name of his, um, of his father. So um, Shaddad comes from a very special family. And... Um, Shaddad was a great companion, but so was his father. And his father was, uh, you know, he was very dear and respected by the Prophet ﷺ. And his father's name was Thabit, um, Aus ibn Thabit. Um, and... Um, The the kunya of uh, Shaddad is Abu Ya'la, uh, so that was the name of his son. And uh, you can tell from his name that uh, he was he is an Ansari, uh, and uh, also that he was a Khazraji. He was from the tribe of Al Khazraj. Uh, when the Prophet Sallam arrived in Medina, uh, at that time Shaddad was a young man. He was in his late teens. And his father, uh, Aus bin Thabit, he accepted Islam at the hands of uh, Musab bin Umair. So, for those of you who have been studying Sirah with me, you will remember that uh, when the Prophet Sallam uh, is still in Mecca, and he is, um, and he, you know, he's starting to encourage people to um, to migrate to Medina. He sends 
uh, Musab ibn Umair as a as an ambassador, you could say. And Musab stays in Medina for a while. And while he stays there, he teaches people. Um, he teaches people Islam. He teaches people uh, different aspects of Islam. And a lot of people embrace Islam at his hands. Uh, in fact, Islam multiplies much quicker in Medina than it has ever done in Mecca. So over 13 years, the number of Muslims you have in Mecca, you have more than that uh, in Medina over a period of a couple of weeks. So, you know, that's how receptive the people of Medina are and how that's how, you know, effective Musab's da uh, da'wah is as well. So, um, Aus bin uh, Thabit, Uh, he is one of the people who who accepts Islam at the hands of Musab ibn Umair. Um, now, when the Prophet uh, comes from uh, Mecca to Medina, I remember we talked about this last time in in our um, in our dars on Sira, that um, he paired up uh, each muhajir with a, with an Ansari. So the 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 emig uh, the immigrants immigrants were paired with the residents, and um, uh, what the Prophet Salam did was he also paired up uh, Aus bin Thabit along with uh, somebody from the Ansar. And if you remember last time when we talked about this, I explained to you that. When the Prophet ﷺ did this this pairing of brothers, he did it. Uh, he didn't just do it, uh, you know, in a, in a haphazard manner. He he tried to pair up people who were like minded or who had some kind of you know similarity in their background or in their uh, in their careers or etc. You know, so it's it's really interesting who he pairs up Aus bin Thabit with and uh, Aus bin Thabit with. Because that shows us the status Aus had uh, in the sight of the Prophet Sallam and his importance uh, in the sight of the Prophet Sallam. So he pairs up Aus with uh, Uthman bin Affan. And as you know, Uthman bin Affan goes on to become the, you know, the third Khalifa uh, of Islam. Uh, so, so you can see that Shaddad, who is the son of Aus, he grows up in this environment uh, with, uh, you know, noble people such as his own father, Uthman uh, radiallahu anhu, and, you know, various other people around him. Um, eventually, uh, Aus uh, was not, did not live for very long, um, you know, with the Prophet Sallam. Uh, as he was um, martyred uh, in the Battle of Uhud. So he took part in the Battle of Badr and he takes part in the Battle of Uhud and that's where he is martyred. So while we're studying the life of Shaddad, we are also covering uh, the life of his father who is Aus bin Thabit. Um, Shaddad's uncle is also someone who is, um, you know, who is of... Uh, you know who's amongst the noble of, of the Sahaba. Um, so, as we said, we're talking about Shaddad, who is Shaddad ibn Aus ibn Thabit al Ansari al Khazraji. Do you know of any other Sahabi with this kind of uh, a name towards the end? Uh, like, for example, uh, Shaddad's father is Aus bin Th uh, bin Thabit. So who would his uncle be? Does anybody know names of any companions with the name uh, Bin Thabit? Okay, very good. So I've got some answers here. Um, Zayd Bin Thabit. Okay, that's that's a very good guess, but it's not right. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you. Um, so I, I don't know if you've heard of Hassan, Hassan Bin Thabit. If you have heard of Hassan bin Thabit, does anybody know what he was known for? So, you know, all the Sahaba, they contributed to Islam, but they contributed in their own ways. So everybody was not a Mujahid. Everybody was not an Alim. Everybody was not, uh, you know, a, a charitable. So different people had different strengths and they all contributed that to Islam. 
Yes, excellent, very good. So Hassan bin Thabit was known, known as the poet of the Prophet and he is the uncle of uh, Shaddad uh, bin Aus bin Thabit and Hassan was known to uh, support the Prophet and defend him through poetry. And we know that at the time of the Sahaba, you know, this was their, their strength. It was language, it was, you know, um, uh, verses, reciting verses of poetry. A lot of people at that time, uh, this is how they would express themselves. This is how they would express their, you know, their feelings or um, their emotions or their reaction to anything. It was all expressed uh, in the form of poetry. So if, if they wanted to, you know, show that they're happy about something or they're upset about something, they would, you know, write a few verses and read them out. And they would also come and read them out, recite them near the Kaaba. So, you know, this was something that was, um, uh, the, that was the practice of the people at that time. Um, so, uh, so yes, Hassan uh, was, you know, uh, one of the people who you know the Prophet he um, he was fond of him. He was you know he was his po he was a poet and he always you know he was always by his side and uh, he, he praised him, defended him, um, you know through through poetry. Now going back to Shaddad, um, you know one day the Prophet Sallam he was uh, Shaddad was with the Prophet Sallam and he was very. Um, he was very quiet and um, he seemed like uh, something is bothering him. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, he said, what happened Shaddad? And he said, the world has become narrow for me. Um, at this point, his father had passed away. Um, he was still a very young man and he was struggling. He was struggling to find his feet. He was struggling to, to you know, um, to... Uh, to to basically survive in the real world so he's just you know he's feeling the that you know uh, he's feeling his father's loss and you know his father's absence and that he has to now do these things on his own so the Prophet ﷺ consoled him and he said very soon Allah will give us victory over Sham and Allah will also give us victory over Palestine and your children who will follow you will be uh, will be leaders amongst those people. So, you know, the Prophet Sallam, he comes in as he always does and he he gives him this positive, um, you know, something positive to look forward to. He gives him some positive input so that, you know, that can cheer uh, Shaddad up. Um, during the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu anhu, he sent Shaddad to these lands as a governor and eventually Shaddad settled down uh, in that area of Sham and a lot of people benefited from him, from his presence there. And while Shaddad was, uh, you know, was in that area of Sham, he participated in the battles that took place in that area and um, many of the Sahaba uh, uh, narrate from him uh, while he was in that in that area, or many of the people of Sham narrate from uh, Shaddad while he was in Sham. Uh, sorry, not many of the Sahaba. Many of the people of Sham narrate from uh, Shaddad um, while he was, uh, you know, settled in that area. Towards the last part of his life, he moved to Palestine. And he settled down uh, near the Bayt al Maqdis. And he, for the most of his life, he stayed apolitical. He, you know, there was, you know, some of the, the political fitna had reached Medina as well. So he just tried to stay away from it and start, tried to stay apolitical for the, you know, majority of his life. Um, he had five children. Uh, as you know, his son's name was Yala. That's why he's known as Abu Yala. His daughter was known as Khazraj. And then he had three other sons uh, other than Yala. He had Muhammad, Abdul Wahab, and Munzir. So, so he had four sons and a daughter. Um, Saeed bin Abdul Aziz says he had two unique characteristics. 
uh, Shaddad had two unique characteristics. One is when he spoke, he was eloquent and clear in his speech. And the second thing is that when he would become angry, he would control his anger very quickly. And uh, Ubada says, Shaddad was someone with both characteristics of knowledge and greatness. And this is this is a very um, uh, this is a very uh, significant characteristic to have, where you can um, you know where you can control your emotions, you can control your uh, your anger, because this re- reflects strength. So the people who are unable to do that are the ones who you could say uh, lack strength, and the people who are able to control their anger or you know they're able to swallow their anger are the people who you would say are the people of strength and like we said that Obada said that Shaddad was someone he had both characteristics of knowledge and gentleness Um, he also uh, was patient and forbearing you know and we can tell that from the fact that he could swallow his anger so you know he had this this characteristic as well of of overlooking of being patient so he was calm and he was a good listener. Imam uh, al-Zahabi, uh, who wrote, uh, you know, um, this volumes of books called uh, Sierra al-Alam al-Nubala, which is it's basically the biographies of all the, you know, companions and also of some of the tabi'in, tabi'at tabi'in. Uh, he recorded uh, one of Shaddad's khutbahs, and he mentioned this. So I'm just going to read out to you what he said. Uh, in one of his uh, khutbahs, one of the khutbahs delivered by Shaddad, he said, O oh people, the world has good in it, and that good is present in front of you. Allah does not make distinction between the believer and disbeliever when granting them worldly pleasures. So, O oh people, focus on the hereafter. Today you run after everything, and you don't save anything for the hereafter. Tomorrow your Lord will stand in front of you and he will have full control on you. If you look for good, look for good in the hereafter as all the good lies in Jannah and every element of evil lies in the fire of hell. So what he's trying to say in this khutbah is he's trying to remind people that uh, there are two types of khair, right? There is the khair of the dunya which is something that Allah gives to who you know to whoever he wills in the sense that you can be a good person and have khair of the dunya you can be a bad person and have khair of the dunya so having khair of the dunya does not reflect on your status with Allah or on your um, virtue okay because the good of the dunya is something that you know Allah gives to whomever he wills uh, but the good of the akhirah, that is something that Allah chooses people for. That is something that Allah does not give to everyone. And He chooses the people f- to give out this good to. And that's why He is encouraging people and saying that, you know, you're running after the dunya and you're running after khair. Run after the khair, which is the real khair, which is jannah. And he's saying that all the khair lies in Jannah. So run after Jannah instead of running after the dunya. And, and you know, once you run after, the, after Jannah, you will have accumulated all the khair or you would have accumulated all the khair that will actually benefit you. Um, so, yeah, this is when, you know, um, it just shows, you, you know, he had insight and he would, you know, he would teach good things um, to the people around him. Um once he was speaking to his students and he said i fear two things for you riya and hidden desire um so riya uh, does anybody know what riya means can anybody tell me if uh you know in the chat or you can un- unmute your mic and say it sure uh yes okay uh, so someone said uh, showing off. So basically, Rhea is doing something to to show people. Uh, so you're doing it to impress someone, okay? 
um, yeah, doing something to be seen by others and, and showing off to be seen, heard. Yes, very good. Um, hidden desire uh, is, um, you know, this is something we spoke about when we spoke about anger. So we said that there are two very strong uh, drives or forces that we have in us as human beings. And one of them is anger and the other one is desire. And if we can control these two, if we can... Uh, tame and manage these two, um, then, you know, we will get a lot of khair and we will stay away from a lot of evil. Okay. So, Abu Darda said, when he heard, you know, Shaddad say this to his students, that, that I fear two things for you, riya and hidden desire. So, Abu Darda said, Oh Allah, forgive us. The Prophet ﷺ told us, uh, Uh, shaitan has become despondent that there will be no shirk in Jaziratul Arab until the end of time. Uh, so he said, hidden desire is understandable, uh, but why Riyah? You know, uh, so he said that, you know, why is Riyah going to be, you know, one of the things that you fear for us? And so then, uh, you know, he, you know, this is this is the explanation that was given that um when you do something to show someone that means that that action lacks sincerity so you're not doing it for the sake of Allah you're not doing it to earn Allah's pleasure you're not doing it to please Allah you're doing it to please people you're doing it to impress people to uh, to earn praise and favor from from people so basically that action becomes zero. It's as if you didn't do it. And if anything, you get sin for doing that action. So it's actually a very, very dangerous action. And uh, it is a very, um, it's a, it's a, it is a very ambiguous area to, to tread on. I'll give you an example uh, to explain to you what I'm trying to say. So there's a scholar, he's a very well-known, uh, renowned, you know, alim. And he went to a village to deliver a, a talk. And when he turned up at that village, there were people had turned up in their thousands to listen to him. He's a very effective, eloquent speaker, mashallah. And when he turned up, he, you know, he saw these you know, hordes of people who have turned up to, to hear what he has to say. And he said a very important thing to them. He said to them, he said, you have all sacrificed your time and uh, you know, made an effort to come here to listen to something that will help you get closer to Allah, that will help you to become better, uh, you know, Muslims, and that will help you to come closer to Allah. And he said that I make du'a that Allah gives you Jannah for you know for making that effort to to come here to listen to a reminder and try and get closer to Allah. He said, as for myself, I don't know if I have come here for the pleasure of Allah or to earn praise and to please the people. So he said, I cannot say for myself that I hope Allah will give me Jannah for this action that I'm doing because, you know, because the, the line between uh, sincerity and showing off is so fine. And it is so, um, it, it is, it is very, uh, you know, it is very delicate. So, you know, that's why it is so important, whatever you do, whenever you do it, that you keep reminding yourself and you keep, uh, you know, uh, constantly going back to purify your intention constantly go back to asking yourself why am I doing what I'm doing what is the reason that I'm doing this what do I want to achieve from this and it is so important I can't stress it enough to to constantly renew our intention in everything that we do especially things which which are public things you know things that we do openly in the public which you know everybody is um, is um, is going to witness or or receive 
So it becomes even more important that we purify our intention and ask ourselves that why are we doing this? Otherwise, can you imagine all the effort, all the hard work that you put into that action and on the day of judgment, everything is zero. You know, you you know, you know, think that, you know, I, I did hours and hours and days and days of, you know, X, Y, Z and at the end of it, you got nothing for it. Um... So Shaddad passed away in the year uh, around 60 AH. Uh, some books say 85 AH. Uh, Allah, Allah, Allah knows best. But he died where he had settled down in Palestine. Remember I said to you that he settled down in Bayt al-Maqdis. So he passes away there in Palestine and he is buried in Palestine. And um, there are about, uh, anybody want to guess how many narrations we have from Shaddad? I'll take any first three people who want to, you know, give a number to it. How many narrations do we have from Shaddad? Okay, that's a good guess. <laughs> Um, so we have we have about 50 okay so he narrated about 50 hadith from the Prophet and um, you know some of uh, Bukhari narrate, uh, recorded one um, and Muslim recorded the one that we're doing right now and then other books have recorded other ones so it's about uh, 50 hadith so that's about the life of Shaddad ibn Aus uh, Ibn Thabit al-Ansari al-Khazraji. So try and remember, you know, uh, some basic points about him. Just a quick recap. So um, he is an Ansari. So he's a resident of Medina. And he is from the tribe of al-Khazraj. So he's a Khazraji. Uh, don't confuse the name of his father with the name of his tribe. Okay. His father's name is Aus bin Thabit. His uncle's name is Hassan bin Thabit. Uh, he has five children, a uh, daughter and four boys, and he um, he took part uh, sorry, he stays apolitical most of his life. He becomes a governor of Sham uh, at the time of Umar who's Khilafa. And then eventually he settles down in Bayt al-Maqdis in Palestine, which is where he dies, and he um, he uh, is buried uh, as well. And um, and he has narrated about fifty hadith from the Prophet uh, He's known for his knowledge, his forbearance, um, controlling his anger. Um, and uh, while he's in Sham, a lot of people narrate from him. So these are just some quick things for you to remember about him. Okay. Oh yeah, and he was very eloquent uh, in his speech, very clear and eloquent when he's eloquent when he spoke. Now coming into the hadith. Okay, getting into the text of the hadith. Um, so the word that is used uh, in the hadith is kutiba. Allah says, I mean, the Prophet says, uh, Inna Allaha katab al ihsan ala kulli shay. Now, the thing is, the word kataba, in the other places when it occurs, it usually uh, symbolizes obligation or it, it symbolizes mandating something. So, for example, you know, there is a verse in the Quran where Allah says, Inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitabam mawkuta. Right? So, so here the word kitab and is saying that you are obliged to pray at these times. Again, Allah says in the Quran, Kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala ladina min kablikum. So again, the word kutiba is used to mean it's mandated. It is, you know, you're obliged to do it. It is fard to do, to do this, right? So, uh, because you know, the scholars have tried to understand that when the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, Allahu, uh, or Allah, um, sorry, 
إن الله كتب الإحسان is it obligatory or is it مستحب or is it like recommended um, so uh, what they have understood from it is that um, it can be both depending on the nature of the action so when it comes to your obligatory ibadah ihsan is obligatory in the obligatory ibadah or when it comes to for example dealing with your parents with respect or with manners it is obligatory because dealing with your parents proper in a good manner is something obligatory so depending on the action ihsan becomes obligatory or mustahab so for example if i was to say that you know how you behave with your parents and how you behave with your friends you behave with both these categories with ihsan however the ihsan in behaving with your parents is obligatory the ihsan in behaving nicely with your friends is mustahab you could say so um it is uh you know it varies depending on on the action you're doing but ihsan is something that that allah loves right and allah says so many times in the quran in so many places that allah loves the muhsinin so this is something that allah is encouraging us to do as much as possible and what is ihsan does anybody understand uh, can anybody tell me you know in in layman's terms what what is ihsan what do we what do we mean when we say that you should have ihsan or you should be a muhsin or you should do something with ihsan what does ihsan mean and we have discussed this um you know when we did the hadith of jibril Okay, so that is the, you could say like a technical meaning of ihsan to worship Allah as if you see Him. Um, so although you do not see Him, He sees you. Can you tell me in one word in English what would you translate ihsan as? Okay, very good. Um, doing something to the best of your ability. Perfection. Okay. Um, so yeah that that's that's a good uh you know good selection of things you you have said there so i would say excellence okay yes very good excellence so whenever you do something you try and do it with excellence so you know uh you know when people do things in a shoddy manner you know like um sort of like half-heartedly um just about you know getting something done or or just like you know uh uh you know just doing something to tick the box this is not what you know as a muslim how we should be or how our approach should be so as muslims what we should be doing is anything that we do and i mean anything it's not just ibada ibada muamalat um dhabiha anything that you do it should be done in the best possible manner. So for example, you know, let's take the example of looking after your teeth. I mean, most people, uh, you know, starting from a base level, a lot of people, they don't even bother with looking after their teeth, right? They don't brush, they don't clean, they don't rinse, they don't do anything apart from the wudu rinsing, right? Then you have above them are uh, the people who um, they'll brush uh, every now and again, okay? Then you have people who brush regularly. Then you have people who brush and use mouthwash, for example. Then you have people who brush, use mouthwash, and floss. So now you're coming closer and closer to ihsan, right? You're coming closer and closer to looking after your teeth in the best possible way, okay? So I'm just giving you an example of teeth. But like I said, ihsan it can be applied across the board in everything that you do, you know? So for example you cook for your family you um uh, you know in your marital relationship with your husband um in um in your salah uh, let's say you exercise and you know you uh, look after your fitness and health all of these things they must be done with ihsan they shouldn't just be done to just say okay, you know, uh, I need to cook. I'm just going to put anything together and just chuck it in front of the kids, you know. Anything you do, do it properly. Do it well. 
you know do it where you feel now that okay you know what i've given this thing it's due i've done it as well as i could do it so um so this is the thing that you know uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us and he loves ihsan and he he wants to see uh, ihsan in us when we do anything i just want to give you a small example just to just to to give you an idea of how deeply ihsan penetrates our lives and our actions and sometimes we might think these things are small and insignificant we, we might not pay attention to them but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pays attention to them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pays attention to every little thing that we do and as long as we're doing it with the niya with the you know uh, with the hope that we're doing this to please allah to get closer to allah inshallah you have no idea you know that little action it might take you you know uh, levels and levels and levels up in jannah so that's why don't belittle anything and it's a really important example i want to give you because it's a really small thing but it's something that i want you to think about so i was just going to give you a very um you know like what i would call like a small example of of ihsan okay so for example let's say you go to the supermarket which is something we all do and um uh, So you go to the supermarket and you uh you know this happens a lot right you let's say you uh I don't know you pick up a bag of peas okay and you put them in your trolley and you walk on and then maybe about 10 minutes later when you're in some other part of the supermarket now you you think to yourself that actually you know what I don't think I want these I think I want um you know uh, i i think i don't need the i don't i don't need peas this time i'm just going to leave them uh i mean normally it it would be okay if you took the peas out and you put them anywhere in any freezer section right because the guys who are you know arranging the supermarket they will probably come and they'll pick it up and they'll put it back wherever it belongs but i'm just giving you an example that it would be from ihsan for you to now go back to where you picked up those peas from and put them back over there okay so you see this is just something small but i'm just saying that if you were to give it that attention now nobody in the supermarket knows or cares that you have this bag of peas and you have put it in the right place or you have not replaced it in the right place right but who knows allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and that's the most important thing because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who you know who appreciates what we do who who um who acknowledges what we do you know we as people as human beings we are very weak in acknowledging each other's um each other's strengths or each other's efforts you know you you find all sorts of people right people are grateful people are not grateful people acknowledge what you've done a lot of people don't acknowledge what you've done you know you see that within your own household for example you know let's say you have you have five children you know you will notice within your children there are some children who appreciate they acknowledge they'll come they'll thank you they'll talk about something you did for them and they'll go on about it because it means a lot to them and then you have some children they they live in oblivion you know it's it's as if it's as if you know um they just take everything for granted you know you never hear a thank you from from them you never hear appreciation from them you never you never hear any acknowledgement from them and as human beings this is how we are with allah mm, some of us are very grateful some of us you know we we recognize and realize every blessing that allah has given us and a lot of us most of us are oblivious we live in oblivion you know we just take it for granted that you know this is all for us so when you do something with ihsan even if it is something as obscure as putting bag a bag of peas in its back in its place from where you picked it up and you know you're just telling yourself that you know out of ihsan i just want to go and put this back in its right place rather than leave it here or there allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he acknowledges these things he notices these things he knows these things uh, i don't want to use the word notice but acknowledges and he appreciates these things and you know inshallah your reward is from allah you know so sometimes you might do something small like this but imagine if you get written amongst the muhsinin 
for doing something like this. Imagine that now you come into the status of those whom Allah loves. So this is just a small example, but I'm just trying to, the point I'm trying to get across, the concept I want to get across is very important, which is that apply ihsan in all aspects of your existence, all aspects. And this is what the hadith is saying, right? The words of the hadith is saying, Inna Allah katab al-ihsana ala kulli shay. You know, in everything. Allah has prescribed excellence in all things. So in all your matters, in all your affairs, in all things, in your relationships, in your day-to-day -day actions, in your dealings, in your behavior, in your uh, characteristics uh, or your, you know, akhlaq, in your, you know, approach, everything. Uh, so whether it is related to your ibadat or your mu'amalat, you know, make sure you apply ihsan. Whatever you do, do it well. Okay, so go the extra mile, improve whatever you can in whatever you do, as much as you can, okay? And, uh, you know, do things in the best way that you can. Um, so, one of the things that would have to happen now, if you want to do things with Ihsan, is there has to be some level of planning or structure when you do something. It can't just be random or haphazard, right? Because... Uh, that's how you will make sure that you have executed that action perfectly. Okay? So for example, uh, you know, let's say when you, wanna, when you want to do salah. Okay? You want to do salah with ihsan. You want to do it with, you know, as perfect. You, you want to make your salah as perfect as you can. So you have to go into that salah with that mindset. You can't be watching a YouTube video uh, on, you know, you can't be, for example, watching a movie, for example, and then suddenly switch that off and say, okay, now I'm going to stand and do salah. You will naturally, throughout that salah, you're going to be thinking about the movie, you're going to be thinking about dialogue, you're going to be thinking about what's going to happen next. It's natural, it's going to pollute your, you know, your, your concentration and your salah. So, you know, um, you have to plan these things out and you have to say, okay, when I'm doing salah, I want to make sure there's no disturbance. I want to make sure that um, before my fard, I do a couple of sunnas to, to get into the you know, framework of salah. Uh, plan what you want to recite in that salah. You know, where, where it might mean that you have to open your mushaf and you have to you know, maybe uh, revise a few verses before you, you know, start your salah. So you know, go into it consci conscientiously so that you, you execute that action perfectly as, as well as you could. You know, as a human being, of course, with whatever, you know, shortcomings we have, we're human beings. But as much as you can, you try to do, do your best. And then your actions of salah should be perfect. They should be executed perfectly. And that will all depend on if you have, you know, if you have learned how to do salah properly. So all of these things, you know, I mean, that, I'm just giving you that as an example. But like I said, it applies across the board in everything you do, you know, uh, as a parent, as a wife, um, as as a daughter, you know, try and be the best role of whatever role you are playing. You know, whether you're a daughter, try and be the best daughter. If you're a mother, try to be the best mother. If you're a wife, try to be the best wife, etc. And an important thing that, uh, you know, some of the scholars mentioned is, uh, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Mulk, He says uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created death and life لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Right? To, to see or to test which of you is the best in action. So the thing that is emphasized is not the quantity, rather the quality. Okay? It's not which of you does the most actions, but which of you is the best in action. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا So it's not, it's not so much about quantity, it's more about quality. So whatever you do, you know, do a few things if you have to because you know you might think that oh this is too overwhelming i can't do all these things perfectly so do a few things but do them well so you know it's good to plan these things out so for example let's say the next month is going to start so make a plan for yourself uh, set yourself reasonable uh, achievable goals and uh, 
targets okay so you know generally we we set targets and milestones for our children so we say that oh my child must learn how to horse ride my child must learn how to memorize quran my child must learn how to cook or x y z right and we forget ourselves you know but the thing is that just as important as it is for the children to to learn and and to have goals and objectives it is just as important for us why is it that our children grow and we don't grow so we all need to grow and so we cannot grow unless we set ourselves objectives and goals even if it's learning a language it can be anything but set yourself objectives and goals and work towards them and set yourself reasonable objectives and goals so let's say you've just had a baby okay so now you are managing uh you know you're managing a a new person so that is going to it is going to affect you know uh your schedule it's going to affect the way you perform it's going to affect a lot of things so cut back on a few things uh because you have to accommodate this new uh you know this new addition in in your life but at the same time that doesn't mean that you go to uh ground level zero right you should still set yourself goals and objectives but reasonable goals that you feel that okay with this new thing that i have to deal with i can still do a b c okay i can't do d e f but i can do a b c so set yourself goals and objectives and work towards them plan them out so that you do them well okay whatever it might be you know that that this month i am going to memorize three surahs Uh, normally i memorize 10 surahs every month but this month i'm going to memorize three surahs so you see although you couldn't do as much as you were doing previously but at the same time you didn't come down to zero you still achieved you still there's still a difference between you at the start of the month and at the end of the month as long as you are growing whether it is slow or fast that doesn't matter so the quantity doesn't matter as long as you are still growing you are still trying to get close to allah you are still trying to uh, achieve an objective and get from a to b that is the important thing and you try and do it in the best possible way that you can so uh, you know i can't stress that enough so you know every time a month starts a year starts you know try and tell yourself that this this month i want to do you know i want to learn this language for example and i want to get fit this month i'm going to lose you know 2 kg for example you know and then work towards it you know you see the difference let's say there are two people who are exercising okay so there is one person person a who goes to who exercises 5 days a week and then there is person b who exercises twice a week okay now um person a who is going five times a week is extremely careless is not really putting any effort or any thought into this you know into this action that they are doing which is exercising five days a week um they are a bit uh, haphazard in the way they're doing it there is no structure there is no system um they're eating all the wrong things after the exercise they go straight to a restaurant and have a burger and fries and a fizzy drink um and while they are at the gym for example where they're exercising they spend half their gym time chatting to other members and you know this is what's going on in this 5 days a week exercise okay then you have person b who is only exercising twice a week but they have thought it through they have planned it they are very structured in what they're doing you know they have a goal in mind they are using the science of exercise when they go to exercise so they say okay i need to have good form i need to have good weight i need to increment you know appropriately i need to eat right less socializing uh i need to watch my timing um you know i need to go heavy on this i need to go light on this today i'm going to work this part of my body today i'm going to work that part of my body etc at the end of a month we know that person a has been to the gym 
uh, more than twice the number of times than person B. Okay? Who do you think is going to get better results? Person A or person B? Person B. Very good. Person B is going to get the best results. Why? Even though person B has done much less than person A, right? If we were to make a table and we were to put the number of times person A has done the same thing that person B has done, person A definitely, you know, has done more. But their quality was lacking. So they will not get the result that person B will get, even though they did less, but they did it well. They put thought into it. They planned it, right? They executed it in a structured manner. So they got the results. So at the end of that month, person B will most likely lose that 2 kg or 3 kg or whatever. And person A would have probably put on 3 kg, even though they were going more often and they were doing more or it seemed like they're doing more. But you see, they, they defeated the purpose because they didn't do it with Ihsan. They didn't do it well. So you see, this is just one example, but what I'm trying to, you know, again and again trying to, um, the concept I need you to, you know, to drill into your heads is whatever you do, do it well. And if you do it well, even if it is little, it will give you the desired result and it will get you from one place to another, whatever it is, whether it's your relationship with people, whether it is um, something you're learning, something you're doing, whatever it is, you will get the best results with Ihsan. And remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the best way we will function. Nobody else can tell us what is the best way that, you know, what is the best way for us to achieve results, except the Creator, the one who created us, the one who put us together. He knows the way we will function best. Um, and you know this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us and this is what he wants for us he wants ihsan for us you know this is something that Allah has you know stressed in many places um, So, in terms of the legal ruling on Ihsan, I've already mentioned there are two degrees of Ihsan. One is the, the first level is mandatory. And like I said, uh, that level requires for you to be just and for you to fulfill any rights towards the creation depending on what rights they have on you. Um, and I gave you the example of, for example, you know, um, <clears throat> being kind to your parents and being kind to your friends. So they are both going to be done with ihsan, but the ihsan that you, uh, you use in executing that kindness to your parents is mandatory, and the ihsan that you use in executing that kindness to your friends is, um, is mustahab. But <clears throat> ihsan is something that is encouraged across the board. Um, you know, some of the scholars, they even said that if you just do your obligatory duties, okay, so for example, it is Dhuhr time, and you get up and you pray four rakahs of uh, Dhuhr, four rakahs fard of Dhuhr, you have done the obligatory duty, right? Now, when you do your sunnahs as well, you do a few sunnahs before, you do a few sunnahs after, now you are executing this action with ihsan. So you are going the extra mile. You're doing the extra that will give you a bonus, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, we care so much about bonuses in the dunya. It's unbelievable. Uh, I think we've all done these things at some point in our life or the other. Where, for example, you know, you buy something and you'll see that there are two things. One comes with, you know, like let's say you buy cooking oil and it comes with a freebie. Right, it comes with a scissor, with a pair of, I don't know, uh, with a box of aluminium foil or something like that. And then you have another, uh, you know, brand of oil, which is maybe it's a better brand of oil, but it doesn't come with anything. 
So generally, you tend to get the one which comes with the freebie because it's a bonus. It's an extra, right? Who doesn't want extras, right? But when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to our deen, when it comes to sending towards our akhirah, we're just happy to do basic things. We're just happy to get our foot into Jannah. You know, we're not thinking, I want to get to Firdaus. I want to get into the highest place. You just think, I just want to get into Jannah. You know, once I'm in, I'm, I'm okay. But when it comes to dunya, you know, we want the best and everything. You know, we, I want the best car. I want the best husband. I want the best wedding party. You know, no one's wedding, wedding uh, dress is going to be anything like mine. Right? We, you know, when it comes to dunya, we, we, are, we are full of, uh, you know, ihsan. <laughs> but when it comes to our akhirah, then it's like, you know, uh, the minimum will do. So we really need to, you know, shift that, um, maybe not even shift the focus, but we need to extend that ihsan you know that we are uh, that we are um, exercising when it comes to our dunya we need to extend it into our akhirah and you know do it all the way you know and make sure that everything we do is done per- per- with perfection um okay so the second level uh, is like i said uh, in terms of legal ruling is mustahab or recommended uh, which means that after a person fulfills their re- legal responsibility, they then go above that by giving every effort, physical or financial, to help that situation better itself in its worldly or hereafter benefits. And this is just like a you know a technical definition. Uh, basically, what I am saying in this definition is anything that brings joy to another human being is a charity and an ihsan okay so anything you do that you know makes the situation slightly better or makes the person feel slightly better this is ihsan okay now uh two things that i want you to understand the difference between there is adl and there is ihsan adl is justice right so if i gave you an egg you give me an egg. If I gave you two pencils, you give me back two pencils. This is Adl, right? What is Ihsan? You give me two pencils, I give you five pencils. Okay, so I surpass what you have done. So you see the difference? One is justice, where you do exactly, you know, you give back exactly what you got. And the other is Ihsan, where you go the extra mile and you, you, uh, you outdo the other person, okay? Um, uh, I was going to say something and it's like completely gone out of my mind now. Um, yes, I was going to say in, in, in a marriage... Uh, it's good to use, uh, you know, ihsan or what we call fadl rather than adl, okay? Adl is justice and fadl is bounty. So, uh, you know, especially in, a, in something like a marriage, you know, it's good to use ihsan. So, you know, go the extra mile, you know, do the extra thing. Don't just be like, you know, okay, you know, you did this for me, so I'm going to do that for you. And you did that, so I'm going to do that. No. You know, your marriage is just going to survive. It's not going to thrive. But if you want it to thrive, you have to go the extra mile. And you will see that everything that is touched by Ihsan, it will thrive, not just survive. Okay. Um, now, Ihsan, it, it, like I said, it extends to everything. It's not just, you know just a few things that come to your mind now the prophet sallam in this particular hadith he gives the example he says thus if you kill kill in a good manner now this killing is specifically talking about when someone has to be put to death uh, so to speak okay it could be capital punishment it could be a had where you know when there was sharia so if you did xyz the punishment for that was capital punishment where you had to be you know, killed. Like, for example, apostasy. If you left Islam, you had to be killed. If you did zina, um, you had to be stoned to death. So there are some things for which you had to be killed. Um, 
the Prophet said thus, if you kill, kill in a good manner. So this is something that, you know, has, uh, I think, even, you know, even the, the Western world has tried to make an effort to do that, you know, when you have to give someone the, the punishment of death, you do it in the, the most painless manner, you know, whether it's a lethal injection or it's this or that. Uh, you know, according to the, the fuqaha, the 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 most painless manner to to kill someone is to remove their head. Uh, nowadays, of course, you know we have other means such as you know injections and um, you know in the past people used to be hung and you know things like that. But uh, the the thing that we should try and you know pay attention to is that uh, even in something like something you know it's it's almost like a. Um, uh, you know what's the word uh, an acronym where you know you n- not an acronym sorry uh, i can't i can't think of the the word that i wanted to say but but what i'm trying to say is you would not think of ihsan and killing in in sort of one uh in one place right because ihsan it it reminds you of something good something extra and then to to talk about ihsan in killing you know it seems to to be like a like an like an ironic example right but the thing is that when you are about to kill someone okay whether it's an animal or a human being you have a position of authority you have a position of superiority over someone and ihsan could not be more important at any other point than at a place like that where now you have the power to to do something nasty, to do something bad. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ is reminding you that, you know, be good, you know, be, um, be extra kind, you know, go the extra mile. Um, the other reason why the Prophet ﷺ mentions, uh, you know, killing a person and, you know, killing, slaughtering animals, which is what we will come to in a little while, is at the time of Jahiliyyah, this is something that the Arabs were known for. They were known for brutally killing people, killing animals, uh, you know, even in their warfare. They were known for mutilating, you know, removing body parts and, you know, doing, doing things which are really nasty. So the Prophet you know, he specially gives this as an example that, you know, when you do this, you do it well. And when Islam came, Islam abolished those bad practices. So they couldn't just, you know, go and kill something in any way they wanted and eat it. They had to kill in a certain way and it had to be clean and purified and then they could eat it. So Islam came and it uh it, it institu- institutionalized a lot of these things that the Muslim that the that the Arabs were doing and it gave it a lot of system and structure. So in the you know, in the days of Jahiliyyah they were very, you know, they're almost like living like animals, you know, sleep with whoever you want, eat whatever you want, kill in any way you want. So Islam comes and it like, you know, it it curbs all of this and it teaches them how to live like human beings and how to behave like human beings. So, you know, this was such an important thing. Um, The the second part of the hadith is where the Prophet said, if you slaughter, slaughter in a good manner. Um... Yeah, and that's where the, the hadith ends, right? Yeah, he says, Slaughter in a good manner. Each of you should sharpen his blade and spare suffering to the animal he is slaughtering. So, uh, this part of the hadith shows us that ihsan is not only important between us as human beings, but it is also important between us and the creation of Allah. And that is that does not just include animals; it includes uh, all the creation of Allah, the earth, the skies, the trees, the plants, the flowers, the grass. You know, looking after our our earth. You know, looking after the environment, not uh, you know uh, polluting the air, not polluting the atmosphere, or or the or you know using things which are not going to add a burden on on the environment and things like that you know so all of these things when we do them when we spend a little bit extra to you know go the extra mile to protect the environment this is all ihsan and inshallah you know i hope allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will you know reward you for your effort um so 
there are three levels of ihsan okay uh, the first level is excellence between you and your lord okay this is the highest level of ihsan which is between you and allah the second level of ihsan is between you and your fellow human being and what is required for you between you and your you know fellow human being is to be kind to someone but that is the easy part right when someone is being nice to you and you're being nice to them there is no ihsan in that but the ihsan is when someone is mean and nasty to you when someone is spewing out hatred and you continue to be nice to them and you continue to uh be kind to them and you continue to say nice things to them this is ihsan um can everyone still hear me because i got a got a message that maybe my connection is a bit weak so if maybe one of you can just tell me you can still hear me right yeah okay good um so so you see being nice to someone who's being nice to you is 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 adil i would say right is 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 something normal that we would do but you know let's say your mother in law um sends you food she cooks food for you and she sends it to you and you call her and you say thank you and you're really happy with yourself that oh you know i have such a good relationship with my mother in law the the following week your mother in law has a spat with you Okay she gets into an argument and she she cusses you she she says you're this and you're that and she speaks down at you how do you behave now so if you were to still you know call her and say a few nice things to her and speak to her nicely and you know maybe send her send her some food now this is ihsan and this is difficult to do and this is putting something heavy in your scale of good deeds It is easy to be nice to someone when when they're being nice to you but the the test of your akhlaq and your ihsan comes out when you are nice to them when they are not being nice to you and the prophet sallam he said um he said a person who is kind to one who is already kind to you is not considered someone who is joining ties someone who joins ties is one who goes to a person who has broken ties with him so when someone is being bad to you and you still try to be nice to them that is ihsan and that is trying to you know uh, trying to go the extra mile and trying to to do something purely for the sake of allah because when someone has been bad to you your reaction or your impulse response is to is to just you know either ignore them or at least give them back uh, as as good as you got right so it's either revenge or ignore but you're not thinking that oh i'm going to be i'm going to do something extra nice for this person now so when you do something nice for someone who was bad to you it's impossible that you are doing it for anything or anyone else you're obviously not doing it for that person because that person has just been rude to you and you're not going to impress anybody else around you the only the only one that you would be doing this for now is for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for your akhirah you're only doing it to put something heavy in your scale of good deeds so that allah is pleased with you and this is something you know something really important that you know we need to we need to reflect on these things we need to think about these things so sometimes i feel you know that we have these durus and i give you so many things and i just keep thinking you know that i hope that if you guys can even go back and try and implement one or two things you have learned out of the 20 things i've given you it would make such a big difference in your existence and it would make such a big difference in your relationships so you know these are things to think about because they're difficult things they're not easy things they're not small things they are big things and that's why their reward is big okay i mean you get allah's love you know what could be more important than that right so if you do something for the sake of allah something like ihsan you get allah's love for it 
Okay, uh, so I said the, there are three levels of Ihsan. The first one is excellence between you and Allah. That is the highest level of Ihsan. The second level of Ihsan is between you and your fellow human being, where I said that you should be equally kind to someone and you should you know, go the extra mile and forgive them if they were bad to you and be nice to them and do something extra for them, even when they were bad to you. The third level of Ihsan is excellence between you and the other creation of Allah. <clears throat> so, you know, if you see an animal who's thirsty and you give him water, this is Ihsan because this animal cannot speak. He cannot, he cannot fend for himself. He cannot defend himself. He, can, he cannot ask for what his need is. Um, similarly, if you see an animal is in pain or is, an animal is struggling and you help him out or you, you, know, you find a bird that is injured on the street or a cat that is, you know, been hit by a car and you take the that that cat or that bird and you take it to the pet shop this was not really your responsibility right these are just stray animals on the streets but if you did that this is ihsan so you you try to help that 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 creature in its time of need uh, if you see a plant that is dying and you put some water you know this is this is ihsan and and like i keep saying that you know people might not see you but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he acknowledges everything we do allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a record of record of everything that we we do and you know as long as we're sincere and we're doing it for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will you know compensate us or recompense us for it so that's the third uh, level where uh, you know it's between you and the creation of allah and i've given you some examples of that um However, just, you know, just as a side point, any animal that is going to cause you harm, you do not have to, you know, help it. You should, you should exterminate it, but in the most painless manner. So whether it's ants or roaches or lizards or snakes, you know, you need to get rid of them. You need to kill them, but just do it in, in one blow, you know, so don't trap ants in a jar and keep them and watch them suffocate to death or you know keep a cockroach and watch how it like you know twists and turns and dies i mean this is this is haram so even these things that you want to kill you just kill them with one blow and they're finished um i'm can we just come back to the meeting so i can just give you my last few finishing points and inshallah we should be done in the next 10 minutes so i just want to you know before i close off i just wanted to mention uh a few basic things about uh, slaughtering animals and just some closing points after that. So it won't take long, inshallah. Um, uh, by the way, I remember the word I was trying to think of, you know, when I was saying that to mention ihsan with killing is like an oxymoron, you know, where you have... Uh, these two things which in your mind are like poles apart, right? You have killing and then you have ihsan. So the, these two things are like very different. But I explained the significance of why the Prophet Sallam, you know, brought these th two things together. is primarily because the, you know, the, the, the Arabs in the times of Jahiliyyah, they had no, uh, you know, scruples or principles uh, governing, you know, how they were, you know, slaughtering or killing people, they would mutilate and do things like that. So it was important to mention this. And, you know, uh, secondly, because that's the time when you have the ability to abuse the power that is in your hands. And that's a very important time for you to execute Ihsan or, you know, to execute that action with Ihsan. Okay. Um, now, Slaughtering, you know, like the Prophet ﷺ says in the last part of this hadith, if you slaughter, slaughter in a good manner. Slaughtering is a very tough thing. So I don't know if any of you have ever tried slaughtering an animal of, you know, any size, whether it's a chicken or a goat or anything. But slaughtering is a very tough thing. And uh, it's, uh, it's also something which... Uh, it doesn't just require physical strength it also requires emotional strength okay um that's why a lot of us you know we will just like you know outsource it and you know ask somebody else to do it but uh it's not something that should be done brutally it is something that has uh, some laws which govern it okay and so some of the things for example i would say is 
you know, like the Prophet ﷺ mentions in this particular hadith, sharpen your knife, okay? So the tool that you use, it should be specific for slaughtering and it should be sharp and ready to use. So it should not be something that you're like, you know, struggling with and, you know, the animal is, is struggling and there you are, you know, trying to put, put an end to his life. It should be something that happens very quickly and swiftly and, you know, that's the end. Uh, secondly, um, The, you know, just to give you in four steps, uh, the legal elements uh, of ihsan in slaughtering are four. Uh, the person slaughtering must be someone from the people of the book. So he should be Muslim, Jew or Christian. Secondly, when you slaughter, you have to make sure that all the blood flows from that animal. So you have to make sure you cut four main basic vessels, if you can call them all vessels. So it's the two jugulars the trachea and the esophagus okay there's differences of opinions but these are the four main things that must be you know cut in one blow when you are slaughtering an animal um, there are two terms used for slaughtering one is nahar and one is dhab okay uh, the difference is nahar is done closer to the trunk and dhab is done closer to the face Okay, um, so that's the difference between the term nahar and dhab. Nahar is usually done in, you know, with large animals like camels. So the, their, their neck is cut closer to the trunk, to the body. And dhab is usually done with smaller animals and their neck is cut closer to the face. Um, so the second thing is that when you slaughter you make sure all the blood flows from it so you would have to cut these four vessels to make sure that all the blood flows number three when you're cutting it or when you're slaughtering allah's name must be mentioned number four uh, make sure that the tool you are using is a slaughtering tool and it is sharp okay uh, the only two things as far as i know that are that are prohibited from being used to slaughter are bone and teeth. Uh, these are animals that you have a control on, like animals like goats and sheep that you can hold and you can slaughter. Then you have animals which run around and they're too swift for you to hold on to them and catch them and do it, such as deer, right? So what you would do is you would shoot and before you shoot, you say Bismillah. You mention Allah's name before you shoot and then you find it and you make sure that, that that is the animal that you shot. And even if you find that the next day, the Prophet ﷺ said, as long as it hasn't started to decompose, you can eat it. Okay? So that's for, you know, something which is not, you know, within your reach. Um, and just as a side point, I... Well, before I go into that, I just wanted to also mention that... Um, with our dealings with animals, there are some prohibitions, okay, that we, there are lines which we should not cross. Um, it is not allowed to, to tie an animal up so that he's not able to hunt and we don't feed him and we don't allow him to hunt. So that's haram. It is not allowed to hunt for entertainment and for fun. So you don't need food, but you just want to like practice your aim. So you go around killing animals. This is not allowed. Um, gentleness uh, is encouraged with animals so when you are slaughtering the animal you should be gentle with the animal and you should uh, you should also uh, not slaughter another animal in front of an animal that is going to be slaughtered and you should not sharpen your knife in front of that animal so these are all etiquettes that Islam taught us even when it comes to you know dealing with other animals so you can see how detailed you know our deen is that nothing goes uh, you know nothing gets overlooked um, if you have mercy on the animal Allah will have mercy on you okay um, so this one of the things I wanted to just mention is a scientific thing that you know they they did this 
you know, in, in the Western world, you hear a lot about, you know, the brutality of slaughtering animals. That's why you have all these, uh, you know, vegans and vegetarians who think animal rights, you know, we can't, we can't eat animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made this halal for us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he created these things uh, for us, you know. So we, ca- we cannot make haram for ourselves what Allah made halal for us. Um, I just want to mention that, you know, they, they, they conducted some, some tests and they said, basically, uh, they ran an EEG, which is something which monitors the waves in your brain. So if you're feeling any pain or whatever you're feeling is going to get monitored on this EEG. And what they did was they, they, they tried to monitor two sets of animals. Uh, one which are being slaughtered in the halal manner and one which are being stunned and killed like it is done in you know in the west uh, a lot of animals are stunned before they are slaughtered so during the first three seconds after slaughtering the EEG did not record any change so when there is no change that means the animal is not feeling anything so within the first three seconds, as soon as you've like gone over his neck, the EEG does not show any movement. So the, the animal does not feel any pain. For the following three seconds, the EEG recorded a condition of deep sleep consci- uh, conscientiousness uh, or consciousness, uh, which means that due to the large amount of blood that is gushing out, because now you've just cut four main you know vessels or four main arteries uh, this excessive blood loss makes the animal sort of go into like a uncon- un- makes him unconscious so he doesn't feel any pain again after this total of six seconds the EEG recorded zero level showing no feeling of pain at all because now the animal is completely gone he's, he's dead but his body is still twitching why is his body twitching because the brain is still there are still reflexes that are still going through the body of the animal and so uh, although the EEG drops to zero uh, the heart is still pounding and the body is twitching and while this is happening so it's like like you could you, you know you could say that the animal is convulsing while this is happening, and this is just a reflex action of the spinal cord. It's not that the animal is feeling any pain at this point. Uh, maximum amount of blood is gushing out of the animal. So what you get at the end of this is an animal who felt no pain during the slaughter. And the meat that you get is free of all the blood. Because that, you know, towards the end when that animal's heart is still pumping really hard. Because he's gone into the fight or flight, you know, uh, situation. It's just removing all the blood from the, uh, the body, right? And it's just like, you know, pushing it all out. Um, so this gives you the healthiest type of meat, which is free of any blood. Now, look at the, the one where they stun the animal. When they stun the animal, the animals were apparently unconscious soon after stunning, but the EEG showed severe pain immediately after stunning. So what the West is thinking is you know you're reducing the pain by stunning the animal before putting the knife on his throat they recorded pain signals from the EEG the the heart of the stunned animal stopped beating earlier than the one slaughtered the Islamic way so when you stun the animal his heart stops beating so what happens is that this causes blood to stagnate in the muscles because the heart is not pumping anymore so the blood is not going anywhere it just stays where it is uh, resulting in the retention of more blood in the meat and if you see meat that comes from Brazil from Australia from various places and you look at the local slaughter here if next time you go to the supermarket go to the butcher section look at the American or the Brazilian meat and look at the local you know meat here the local meat here looks pink and light that meat looks laden with blood and honestly if we are really going to be honest with ourselves, we have to admit that these practices are not being done with the best interest of the animal at heart. They are being done for economical reasons. Why is it economically uh, better for a person to stun the animal 
than to do it according to Islamic halal slaughter. Can anybody tell me? What do you think? Okay, um, I, I take that point. Yes, uh, you're right. That is one of the points that when you're stunning, you're just going through the line very quickly, right? You just go stun, 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 and then, you know, you just slaughter. It, it does happen, you know, in terms of production, yeah, it will happen much quicker and it will take less manpower and less, you know, effort. There's another important thing. Can anybody tell me what that is? Is it to do with... Um if you've got more blood in the meat or way yes excellent excellent so you see when when the the heart stops beating and more of the blood stagnates now when you sell 1 kg of meat for for example 10 dollars that 1 kg of meat is less meat and more blood whereas the halal slaughter when you sell 1 kg of meat it's mostly meat because there's hardly any blood in it now so you see for economical reasons, to make more money, they make you think that, oh, you're really brutal in the way you're doing this. You know, we're going to be more kind to the animal. So they're actually giving the animal more pain just to make more money and make you think that actually, you know, we're just doing it because we have the best interest of the animal at, at heart. Whereas it's not that. They're getting more money. So for for a 10 kg animal, they will make more money from the one which has blood in its muscles than the same 10 kg animal who has got no blood in his muscles, right? So this is just something, it's a complete tangent to the hadith, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention just, you know, because I think it's so important for us as Muslims to be aware and to be able to understand what we do, why we do it this way, and to be able to defend ourselves and to stand up, you know, when people, when people challenge us to these things. So we should understand what we're doing and, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful in the way he taught us to slaughter. You know, if Allah had not taught us to slaughter like this, we would be, you know, following the, the uh, you know, the, um, uh, the rest of the people and, and, you know, doing, you know, killing animals in a way which is actually quite heartless and, and painful. So, uh, you know, so subhanAllah, you know, these, these are the two main things. They save money and they get more money. So they save money because the production plant moves quicker this way by stunning. And secondly, they get more money because the, the meat is heavier because it's got all this blood. So you're getting less meat and more blood and you're paying the same amount of money. And you think that, you know, uh, you know, you think you're getting a, a better deal. Um, so these are all, you know, just the, the you could say like the um, double standards, you know, that the West implements, not just in this, but it across the board in everything else, you know, uh, double standards in, in, in everything that, you know, that they, that they do, um, you know, they make you think one thing, but they're actually doing it for other reasons, you know, they always have an ulterior motive, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us something or teaches us something, it's only purely for our benefit, but when people tell you something, there's usually a catch, you know, there's usually, there must be something in it for them, okay, so, of course, you know, we'll benefit the most when we, when we go with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. Um, so, you know, uh, this is basically, you know, what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I, I, just uh, one other thing I, I can, you know, add to this is, you know, when we, have, when we show ihsan towards the other creatures of Allah, I forgot to mention the angels, that we should also show Ihsan uh, towards the angels. How do you think we can show Ihsan towards the angels? Anybody? So I want you to tell me two things. One is Ihsan towards the angels, and how do we so show Ihsan towards the disbelievers? Because remember we said there should be ihsan in everything we do. Okay, so the angels might be a tough one, so I'll tell you. Uh, so you know there are some things that the angels don't like, right? Angels are very sensitive to smell. So, you know, to keep your breath clean and pure uh, when you do salah, uh, even if you're not going to the masjid, even when you're at home and you're praying or you're talking, to try and keep your breath smelling good. 
This is ihsan towards the angels. So it will encourage the angels to come closer to you rather than stay away from you. Because if you have, you know, any kind of bad smell from you, they will stay away from you. Similarly, you know, even for you to like regularly shower, keep yourself clean so that you smell good. And that encourages the angels to come, you know, close to you. So things which offend the angels, if you keep away from them, then that is a, you know, that is ihsan towards the angels. Um... Ihsan towards the disbelievers. What do you think? How do you think we can have Ihsan towards disbelievers? What is the best thing that you can do for a disbeliever? Okay, so one of my one of my girls has answered, but I'm going to wait to see if any of you can answer. Yes, excellent. Uh, so I would say either invite to Islam or make dua for their hidayah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so Ihsan is demonstrated towards the disbelievers by praying to Allah to guide them to Islam and by, by doing da'wah to them. This is Ihsan to them. Yes, this is the best thing you can do for them. You know, be- better than, you know, it surpasses anything else that you would do for them. So, yes, basically, um, that's, I think, uh, the end of what I wanted to share with you. Um, and, uh, you know, just to, just to reiterate again, that whatever you do, uh, however, you know, uh, in whatever walk of life, whether it's a relationship or it's an action that you're doing or uh, something that you're learning, something that you're delivering, in all walks of your life, you know, try and make sure that excellence becomes, uh, you know, a part of that action. And you will see that it will not just survive, but it will thrive, uh, whatever that, that might be. And you will get the best results when you when you um, you know add this really important ingredient of ihsan to whatever you do, from small things to big things, and don't ever belittle anything. Everything is important, um, and uh, you know, I, I I have told you the story before, but I'm just going to just mention it again, because you know I have a different you know group of people now. But you remember the story I told you about the student. Um, so there was a student at university, and he was with this, uh, you know, uh, the the Muslim Students Association. And uh, so what they had done was at university, they had said to these students that we're going to give out uh, masahif, okay, uh, in the street to the people who are just passing by. So this guy, you know, he got he got a bunch of masahif or you know leaflets, and he's giving them out. And he's, as he's giving them out, he was thinking, you know, that I don't even know what the point of this is because a lot of these people, they're going to take this. They're not even going to go back and look at it. So he's just giving them out anyway. All right. Now, one of the people who took a mushaf from this student, uh, he went on to read the Quran. It really struck him the first few verses and he became, became a Muslim. Not only did he become a Muslim, he went on to study Islam in so much detail, he became an imam of a masjid. He becomes an imam and he goes on to take the shahada of many people in their tens or in their hundreds. He gives them shahada because he's now an imam of a masjid. And you can imagine he's delivering sermons, he's doing lectures, durus, and he's taking shahada, uh, he's giving shahada to the people. Now, go back to the beginning of the story. We had a student who's just with, you know, his students, uh, you know, school students, Muslim association. And he's asked to do a simple thing like giving out masahif. And he's thinking, what's the point of this? What am I going to get from this? When he comes on the day of judgment and he sees in his mountain of deeds, there are all these shahadas, there are all these khutbas, there are all these great actions. He's going to think, where did this come from? He has no idea. When did I do all this? Right? So going back to the beginning of the story, it was a small action which most of us, we would just just flick off, right? We think, oh, you know, this, we belittle it. It's, it's not a big thing to hand out brochures on the street. But you don't know that brochure. It might turn something on in someone's heart or in someone's head. That's why even, you know, the hadith says that if the trumpet is blown, 
and you have some seeds in your hands and you're about to put them in the ground to plant them, throw them. Because on the day of judgment, you will need every little deed, every little action that you did, every little hasana that you can get. You know, you will, you will wish on that day that I wish I had said, you know, more subhanallah wa bihamdi. I wish I had not wasted my time with that and instead I had said, la ilaha illallah. You know, these are little things, but on that day we will, we will be, you know, we will be, uh, you know, looking for any little thing that we could have said or we had done, you know, and we will, we will use that. And we, that will be of, you know, of benefit to us. So don't belittle anything. It can be the smallest, most insignificant thing. Like I gave you the example of the bag of peas, right? I mean, you might think that, what's the big deal? I'll just put it in the freezer, you know, somebody will come and put it back in its place. But you don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He is the one who is, you know, who is taking, you know, keeping record of everything that you're doing. And this might be something that earns you the, the love of Allah. I mean, who, how many of us would have thought that something small like that is going to earn me Allah's love? So that's why I'm saying that don't belittle anything and everything is important. Everything you do is important and everything that happens, it happens with a purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't do anything without a purpose. So I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us amongst those who, um, you know, who are able to implement ihsan in our ibadah, in our mu'amalat, in our relationships, in everything that we do. We are able to plan it, structure it, and implement uh, this ihsan so that we can take that same action to the next level and earn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love in exchange for, you know, for a small effort from ourselves. وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. There was a there was a, a statement by a scholar uh, that I wanted to just mention, um, but I I'm not going to give you the exact statement, but I'm just going to paraphrase what he said. But he said that we need to keep encouraging people to do better, to to try and you know excel in what they do, and he said if people start doing that the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea will pray for their forgiveness because you are trying to make uh, the world a better place. And so he's just encouraging Ihsan this way by saying that, you know, apart from earning, you know, um, you know our main, our main uh, goal is to earn Allah's love. The, the birds and the beasts will make dua for your forgiveness because you are trying to do something, you know, something noble. <clears throat> so, um, you know, if, if there are any questions, you're welcome to ask. Otherwise, you know, if you want to leave, um, you're welcome to. You know, this was a hadith. I was, I, was, I was in two minds, you know, shall I do it, shall I skip it? But I think it was so important, and I'm, I'm really glad that we, you know, Allah gave us the opportunity to, to uh, you know, to cover it. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, uh, he, this was... Uh, this was your risk so you know uh, he enabled you to attend this meeting and to you know hear these words and to benefit from them and uh, you know this was this was your risk this ilm that you got today was your risk and uh, I'm, I'm really gr grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to share these things with you and um, you know I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from us all barakallahu feekum I'm always very very happy to see you all here and um you know, uh, it's, I'm very grateful to Allah that in spite of the lockdown, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept us connected, you know, through his remembrance and through his words and, you know, through, through his deen. So <clears throat> I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, always keeps us connected and inshallah we benefit from each other. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah. I think uh, really some of us were able to even, you know, even do this because of the lockdown. So, you know, we have, you know, less, uh, uh, less commitments than we used to have. So we're able to do this, alhamdulillah. So next time, inshallah, we will continue with seerah. And then the following time after that, we, we're going to do a very important hadith, which I will have to split, uh, which is hadith number 18. That's a very, um, you know, famous hadith, inshallah. We will... Uh, We'll try and cover that. Uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us another opportunity to meet again. And barakallah uh, fikum to all of you. And uh, thank you for attending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
you know, forgive us all and uh, make us amongst those whom, uh, you know, who are beloved to him and who have earned his love. وسبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وآخر دعواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين